Senator Roberts has submitted a proposal understanding Order 75 today. It is shown at item 12 of today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? Thank you. Um, with the concurrence of the Senate, the clerks will set the clock in line with the informal arrangements made by the whips. And I call Senator Roberts. Thank you. As a servant to the many different people who make up our one Queensland community, fear-based net zero climate policies are harming everyday Australians and have no environmental or scientific justification. Yesterday, this chamber saw a display from the Greens that is best described as fear-based. I could feel their terror, terrified. It was not fear of some impending human barbecue. It's fear of impending political irrelevance. The public are starting to wake up that climate change is the greatest display of mass formation psychosis since the Salem witch hunts. Last week, last weekend, Tory Prime Minister Sunak in Britain won a surprise victory in the Uxbridge by-election campaigning against Lord Mayor Sadiq Khan's net zero policies. A Conservative politician took a stand against net zero and won. The British media have sensed the changing mood and their reporting tone has changed. Here's a sample of their headline from the last few weeks. Change the ludicrous net zero timetable, Daily Telegraph. The Prime Minister must be bold and delay our net zero deadline or the cost will be ruinous. The Sun saying what I have been saying for the last 15 years, except I've been saying cancel, not just delay, cancel. Sunak will have to, know, will have to water down net zero, the spectator. The Washington Post weighed in with backlash to climate policies is growing. The UK going off reservation and winding back net zero will provide economic competition to countries like Australia who continue to commit economic suicide with a net zero agenda. Same. The money flowing into the pockets of the predatory billionaires who are behind this scam is already under threat. Swedish state energy company Vattenfall has announced one of the world's biggest offshore wind developments. The 1400 megawatt Norfolk Boreas project in the UK has been suspended due to spiralling costs. Increasing prices for wind turbine materials including copper, zinc, chromium, nickel, rare earth, cement and oil for the fibreglass blades, gearbox and lubricants have caused a 40% cost overrun. This pushed their projected cost per megawatt hour from $85 to over $100 a megawatt hour. Offshore wind is not cheap electricity and it never will be. Wind energy is expensive and due to the laws of physics always will be prohibitively expensive. This insane ideology is causing everyday Australians to feel deep pain, hurt. Building a home is getting dearer because all of these materials used in net zero are used in homes. Rising construction costs mean home ownership is harder and rents are increasing. Retooling our entire energy grid, both generation and transmission, is transferring hundreds of billions of dollars out of the pockets of everyday Australians into the pockets of the climate carpetbaggers running this scam, Dang. using rising electricity prices and higher taxes. We are the world's most energy-rich country, yet have some of the world's highest prices for electricity. As we export coal and uranium, so foreign countries can have cheap, reliable power. Yet Greens, Liberals, Labor, Nationals, energy policies means we cannot use it here, all in the name of this new religion of green self-flagellation. In two weeks, I will be visiting the site of the latest green environmental vandalism in Chalumba and Queensland. Thousands of hectares of native forests to be chopped down for an industrial wind turbine complex killing the environment to save it, apparently. Oil companies are experiencing record margins and profits thanks to the Albanese government allowing this profiteering despite having the power to bring prices down. The higher the price of petrol, the less people use their cars, allowing the Albanese bond government to claim that reduction has progress towards net zero. Progress towards net zero. All of this is based on faulty science and selective misuse of natural events. Fraud. Fraud. We were told this was the hottest July on record, when in fact it was the hottest July since last year. We were told the ice extent is shrinking, however the Arctic is within, is within long-term fluctuations and the Antarctic is not melting, except for the section with a significant volcanic eruption under the ice. You fearmongers didn't bother to mention that, did you? In my adjournment speech tonight, I'll speak on the warmer's scientific fraud. Even the fearmonger in chief, Jim Scare, the new head of the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has had to ask for an end to the hyperbole. Speaking on the we weekend, Shia said, quote, we should not despair and fall into a state of shock if global temperatures were to increase by 1.5 degrees. 
The world won't end if it warms by more than 1.5 degrees, Skia said. Rebranding climate change as, as climate boiling is designed to drive fear. Senator McKim said yesterday, billions of people will die. That's what he said. No facts, just fear, because the Greens are terrified of the rapidly changing public mood. People are waking up that the public are being bullied into continued support for policies that achieve nothing except hurt human beings and harm our natural environment. And now in this debate, the Greens are Thank silent. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Your time has expired. Senator Brown. Thank you, uh, Mr President. And it's, um, it's always good to follow Senator to Roberts' um, contribution, contribution uh, to um, what is a very important uh, issue, um, President. Um, we are, despite the previous contribution, we are living in a climate emergency. This is our reality, an emergency which is showing us that our summers will be marred by extreme of, of bushfires and floods. In the black summer, summer bushfires in 2019-2020, 24 million hectares of land was destroyed. Millions of native animals were killed, 33 people directly lost their lives, and a further 450 are estimated to have died due to smoke inhalation. In 2022, Eastern Australia was devastated by repeated floods. At least 22 people lost their lives, thousands losing their homes or businesses, with an estimated $5 billion hit to the economy. Last year in Australia, seven out of ten people lived in an area declared as a natural disaster zone at some point in their life, often more than once. Since coming into office, this government hasn't wasted a moment in getting on with the job. We've lifted our 2030 emissions reduction target by half from 26 per cent to 43 per cent. Just two weeks ago, we announced we will be de developing a decarbonisation plan for each major section, sector of the Australian economy, underpinned by sector-wide economic modelling to set us on a path to reaching our ambitious but achievable goal of net zero by 2050. One of those industries is one I work closely with in my responsibility for, um, as an Assistant Minister for Infrastructure and Transport. The transport industry contributes 19 per cent of all greenhouse gases in Australia, vastly more than any other industries. Since 2005, greenhouse gas emissions have increased by 11 per cent and are currently projected to be the largest source of CO2 emissions in Australia by 2030. This government knows that reducing emissions in the transport sector through using more renewable energy sources will require concerted action across government and industry to secure long-lasting benefits while managing and minimising the impacts of the transition. That's why this government is acting through the development of a transport and infrastructure net zero roadmap and action plan. A draft roadmap will be developed this year and the action plan will be drafted in early 2024. This action plan will present an integrated decarbonisation roadmap to ensure that we take up the opportunities by carefully managing the transition to new energy sources. Further, the government is already decarbonising the transport sector through increasing the update of electric vehicles and developing a fuel efficiency standard through the National Electric Vehicle Strategy. Fuel efficiency standards are common elsewhere around the world. In fact, in fact through the inaction of the former government, Australia is playing catch-up in introducing these standards. That, that's just a fact. We are playing catch-up because of the inaction at, of the previous government. Fuel, fuel efficiency standards help by reducing transport emissions, improving air 
quality in and around our cities, making it easier for Australians to breathe, and importantly, to, to ensure that people around the country fuel efficiency standards will save money at the petrol pump. Moving away from how we are tackling emissions in transport, the government has also reformed the safeguard mechanism. This mechanism is an important reform and one which we took to the Australian people at the last election and received a strong mandate for. And no amount of um, denial by those opposite that seek to uh, undermine the climate emergency. What a delight it is to follow Senator Brown in that rousing contribution about the government's position on uh, the motion before us. Uh, I like Utopia, and I'm pretty sure that the Albanese Labor government have picked most of their policy nomenclature from the script of Utopia. We've got a sector-wide strategy, we've got a roadmap, we've got an action plan, and all of it is going to lead nowhere, frankly, and apart from disaster and destruction for the Australian economy. The offshoring of jobs, the increasing pressures on household budgets, and all of it on the basis of what Senator Brown and her colleagues describe as a climate emergency. Someone must have missed the memo because earlier today, during question time, the government actually did refer to something that is impacting on Australians, and that is the cost of living crisis that we're facing. Now, thank the good Lord, of course, the Reserve Bank today put a hold on interest rates, but someone has missed the memo in that contribution just given from and on behalf of the Australian government about what really matters to Australians. Now, I have to apologise to Senator Roberts because while your motion is fantastic in many respects, it is not going to change a blasted thing when it comes to the direction the Australian government is taking with their bedfellows down the end here, the Australian Greens. Disastrous and destructive policies based on anything other than science, emotion, headline grabs, utopia scripts, as we've already heard today. I mean, if we look at these things, and, and I think the construction of your motion there points to some very important points um, through you, President, I say to Senator Roberts, because balance and proportionality is important when it comes to government responses. Now, I don't know that there's anyone in this chamber that wants to destroy the environment, contrary to the assertions that are often made about people being planet haters and climate deniers. I actually want this place to be a wonderful place for my three sons and their children, should they choose to have them. I'd like them to enjoy the beautiful wilderness in Tasmania. Um, but shutting down entire industries um, without any regard for the economic impact, I think, is irresponsible. And it won't fix a climate emergency. And it will, in fact, make worse this cost of living crisis. Yeah, take, for example, you know, in this climate emergency that Senator Brown referred to in her contribution and talking about the bushfires on the east coast of Australia in recent times, <laughs> it's Labor across the country that are shutting down the native forest industry. They want to lock up swathes of forest and throw away the key. No management whatsoever. We've seen it happen in Victoria. We've seen it happen in Western Australia. And you know what? When you remove management of our productive forests, we increase bushfire risks. You see Buncombe reports out there suggesting forestry contributes to bushfires. I'll tell you what, not managing forests is actually bad uh, for sorry, our environment. Senator, Dunham. Yes. Senator McKim, I've called you to order. I expect you to stop interjecting. Senator Dunham. Thank you for your protection, President. I do appreciate it very much. But look, as I continue to make my fact based, science based points, I want to demonstrate the uh, lack of logic in the government's thinking. And when you have groups like the Labor Environment Action Network probably going to take over the Australian Labor Party at the next federal convention, who knows? I'm reading a few things that are sending out concerning messages about the direction of this government and their policies. It's a real concern. Uh, and you see policies like this, the shutting down of the native forest industry, not based on science, because that is not factored in anywhere in any of these policy decisions by the two state Labor governments that have pursued this. And goodness knows what this government will do when it comes their turn to make a decision about the future of that industry. We are supposed to be problem solvers and we're supposed to be dealing with the issues that affect Australians most. And the ridiculous contribution that was made earlier about what crisis people are facing when they can't pay their power bills, 
I can't keep the lights on, can't heat the home this winter, can't put fuel in the car, can't put food on the table is ridiculous. And their climate policies, like the safeguard mechanism, which we oppose proudly, because all that will do is send jobs offshore along with the emissions that will be inevitably increased. When those businesses, those heavy um, emitters, go to jurisdictions where they don't give a damn about the environment, they don't care about emissions, it will be a net negative for our environment and it will certainly be a net negative for our economy, for households that are struggling already. So I have to say I'm concerned about where they're headed, but unfortunately, Senator Roberts, I have to say no amount of motions in this place will ever get them to see sense. Only at the ballot box will they be proven wrong Thank about you, these Senator ridiculous Dunian. policies. Your time has expired. Senator Babette. Thank you, President. I wholeheartedly support Senator Roberts' urgency motion. The Australian people, they are victims of our government's blind pursuit of net zero. Labor and the Greens are, quite frankly, climate catastrophe cookers. That's what they are. Now, their rhetoric has reached boiling point. Well, at least I think it's boiling, or is it warming, or is it changing? Just make up your mind. Make up your mind, guys. Just stop scaring the kids. Now, to those of us who put Australians first in this place, yesterday we were referred to as sociopathic agents. <laughs> I would suggest. Uh, Senator Babette, may I remind you that remark was withdrawn. It is not appropriate to repeat it. Thank you, President. Now, I would suggest that uh, the real sociopath's president... Uh, Senator Babette, <laughs> I've asked you not yes, to revisit something that was re withdrawn. It's not a request, it's an order. Thank you. Thank you, President. Now, those who would weaponise climate fear, let's put it that way, those who would weaponise climate fear in order to appease their globalist and corporate interests are no friends of Australia, and I'll tell you why. They are championing the shutdown of our cheap, reliable coal and gas-fired power, while China is fast-tracking hundreds of coal-fired power plants. China already has six times more coal-fired power plants than the rest of the world combined, but it wants even more. Last year, China approved 106 gigawatts of new coal-fired power projects. That's five times more than all the coal-fired power stations in Australia's national electricity market. And we know why they're doing this. Coal power is cheap and coal power is reliable. China is flourishing, but the cost of everything in Australia is going through the roof and our standard of living is decreasing. Australian pensioners and battlers, they can't afford to heat or cool their homes. Australian families can't afford to pay grocery bills and China's energy cost advantages are killing Australia's manufacturing sector. Now, the insanity of the climate cult will eventually bankrupt Australia. Now, fear is not grounded in fact, and I'll take this opportunity to remind the Australian people of some historical far-left fear-mongering. Our friends at The Guardian back in 2004 warned former US President Bush that Britain would have a Siberian climate by 2020. In 2007, Professor Flannery claimed, and I quote, even the rain that falls isn't going to fill our dams and our river systems. In 2007, 8 and 9, Al Gore claimed that there was a scientific consensus that the North Pole would be ice-free by 2013. Well, I think Santa's home's pretty safe for now. In 2018, Greta Thunberg tweeted, and I'll quote again, a top climate change scientist is warning that climate, that climate change will wipe out all of humanity unless we stop using fossil fuels over the next five years. Well, it's 2023. I guess we'd better pray that we're all not wiped out in the next four months. Thanks, Greta. As you can tell from this sample of quotes, apparently the science is well and truly settled. But I'll tell you what. These people are as cooked as their predictions. Our government is so obsessed with net zero that it is sacrificing our economy for policies that make net zero sense. And the only people who benefit from this, the only ones, are the globalists and, of course, the CCP. That's who benefits. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Babette. Senator Rennick. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. And it's great to uh, speak this afternoon to this uh, MPI. Uh, and I have to say I agree with it. Uh, there is no doubt that the policies being adopted by the Labor government are without a doubt harming Australians because they, it is pushing up their obsession with renewable energy. Uh, and I use that word flippantly because this energy isn't renewable. It can't actually even be recycled, or at least not for three times the cost of making it. And that's quoted. Uh, from the very mouth of the head of the uh, former head of the CSIRO, but yet for some reason uh, they, the CSIRO doesn't want to include the cost of recycling uh, renewables uh, in in their uh, Gen Cost report, uh, and that's something I'll touch on in a minute. But I really want to focus on the cost of living today, at a time when Australians are struggling under the cost of living, and as my uh, colleague Senator Dunham pointed out, they're struggling under high interest rates. Uh, brought about by Labor's mismanagement, they are also driving up the cost of energy because the cost of renewables uh, is very expensive. It's not just the renewable energy that, you know, it's not just the point of delivery that matters. It's the cost of transmission, it's the cost of storage, it's the cost of security, all the, the frequency control, everything like that. All of that costs money. And these are the hidden costs that aren't actually put into the energy budget models. Uh, and it is misleading the Australian people, and unfortunately, it is hurting them in their hip pocket. And if we want to, uh, you know, uh, solve this problem, we need to be very honest uh, about the cost of renewable energy, because that is how it is harming the Australian people. But it's not just the Australian people that are being harmed. I myself have been up to the Chilumbin Wind Farm, the proposed Chilumbin Wind Farm site. Uh, it's in the Great Barrier Reef Basin. Uh, it beggars belief that farmers are required. Uh, to uh, 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 prepare a basin management plan at, at, at you know, a, a great cost of up to $10,000, and they face $200,000 fines uh, if you know, some guy from the Department of Natural Resources decides that they're not doing whatever they're doing properly. Uh, hopefully that is only ever going to be used in uh, extreme cases where there's justification for it, but I fear that won't necessarily be the case. But no, it's not just the economy that suffers as a result of this obsession with net zero. It's actually our environment itself. Uh, and we've got a lot of sites in Queensland. We've got the Chilumban Wind Farm. We've got Yungala uh, upstream of the Pioneer River in, in Mackay, where the Queensland state government is proposing to take on an enormous pump hydro project. Uh, now, this project is, is slated to uh, provide uh, five gigawatts of energy. Uh, now you lose 20 per cent straight away when you do uh, pumped hydro projects because you've got to push you know, your waste energy pushing it up the hill. So it's going to be at least six giga, uh, gigawatt, uh, gigawatts yep, got the right giga, gigawatts of energy uh, that have to be provided by wind farms. Now Queensland on average uses about nine gigawatts of energy a day. So we are talking about building enough wind farms to provide two-thirds of Queensland's energy uh, in pristine native forest. Uh, upstream of Mackay. Uh, and then that energy is then going to have to be transported uh, a thousand kilometres south back to Brisbane, if not further. So there will be further energy losses in the transmission lines as this uh, energy is transported downstream. So this is going to be very expensive. Uh, there's, it's one of the uh, world's um, more uh, precious sites when it comes to platypus habitat. There are a lot of platypuses up there. Um, uh, in the Yungala uh, region uh, upstream of Mackay. So it's another example of how the renewables that are supposed to be actually saving the environment are actually uh, a threat to the environment and our biodiversity. And of course, I'm just touching on, on, on this because we're going to have to build something like 10,000 kilometres of transmission lines across the country. Uh, and of course, there's another Orwellian term uh, that's used to fund this called the Rewiring Australia Fund. No, it's not rewiring the Australian fund. It's adding more transmission lines, the transmission lines that are already there, in order to connect these isolated renewable projects uh, to the grid. Now, you know, 30 years ago, we had about 30 power stations on the east coast of Australia that provided all, all the energy's grid. And they mightn't be pretty. I'm not saying they are, but they were contained within a small footprint. These renewable projects are going to be spread across the environments and across the country, 10,000 kilometres of transmission lines, another 10,000 kilometres of transmission lines. Enormous mines are going to have to be you know, involved in getting the rare earth metals out of the ground. I've said this on numerous occasions. These so-called rare earths might be 
rare in the sense that their ore body is very small. The percentage of metal in your body is very small. It is going to be very damaging. And thanks very much. Senator Hanson. I rise to commend Senator Roberts for getting to the heart of this debate. There is no logical justification for the major parties' terrible climate change policies. Let's look at the facts. Climate policy is aimed at reducing global emissions of carbon dioxide. Global carbon dioxide emissions are increasing because carbon dioxide follows temperature by approximately 700 years or more. Therefore, climate policy is not working. It is not working because the world's human population is the source of only 3 per cent of the world's carbon dioxide. The rest comes from natural sources like volcanoes, animals, soil and oceans. Carbon dioxide is not a pollution. It is a natural gas essential to virtual, virtually all life on earth. The major parties' climate policies do not address the 97 per cent of carbon dioxide from natural sources because they can't. They are beyond anyone's control. So instead of having its intended effect, the major parties' climate policies have only ever had one real impact. Electricity costs more. Electricity today costs three times as much as it did 20 years ago. Australia has some of the biggest natural energy resources in the world, but pays some of the highest energy prices in the world due in part to a profound shortage of energy. This does not make any sense. Yesterday, we were treated to a childish display of temper from the Green Senator McKim. Yesterday, across the chamber, as Senator Canavan over Australia's 1 per cent of human carbon dioxide emissions. Why aren't these Greens yelling at China, responsible for 30 per cent of human carbon dioxide? That country produces 12 billion tonnes of it, and this will rise by another 2 billion tonnes by 2030. This would wipe out any reductions by Australia, which produces less than 500 million tonnes. You could reduce Australia's carbon dioxide to zero overnight, and within a year this reduction would be overtaken by China's increased carbon dioxide. China also mines almost 4.5 billion tonnes of coal per year. Australia mines about 560 million tonnes. Senator McKim and his fellow Green hypocrites love to run down and insult Australia but never say a word about the country which produces 25 times as much carbon dioxide as Australia and nine times as much coal. The Greens are the very definition of hypocrisy with absolutely no empathy for Australian families struggling with some of the highest energy bills in the world. And Senator McKim would do well to understand that lack of empathy is the very definition of a psychopath. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, Senator Roberts' motion talks about fear and climate change. Uh, it seems to me that the people harbouring the greatest fears are climate scientists, those that are actually doing the research, looking at what's happening and some of the projections for the future. Uh, I thought I'd read out a few of their thoughts from an article last week. Uh, I'll start with uh, Dr Joel Gerges, senior lecturer at the ANU's Fenner School. I'm stunned by the ferocity of the impacts we're currently experiencing. I'm really dreading the devastation I know this El Nino will bring. As the situation deteriorates, it makes me wonder how I can be most helpful at a time like this. Do I keep trying to pursue my research career or devote even more of my time to warning the public? The pressure and anxiety of working through an escalating crisis is taking its toll on many of us. Bill Hare, physicist and climate scientist and chief executive of Climate Analytics. As today's monstrous, deadly heat waves overtake large parts of Asia, Europe and North America, with temperatures the likes of which we have never experienced, we find even 1.2 degrees Celsius of global warming isn't safe. Professor Matthew England from the Australian Centre for Excellence in Antarctic Studies. While we've been saying for decades now that this is what to expect, it's still very confronting to see these climate extremes play out with such ferocity and with such global reach. It's going to be Australia's turn this summer, no doubt about it. It makes me feel deeply frustrated to watch the slow pace of policy action. It's bewildering to see new fossil fuel extraction projects still getting the go-ahead here in Australia. And with this comes deep resentment for those who have lobbied for ongoing fossil fuel use despite the clear climate physics that have been known for almost half a century. Uh, Professor Katrin Meisner, Director of the Climate Change Research Centre 
at New South Wales says, was I surprised by this heat wave? Of course I was not. If anything, I felt a mild scientific curiosity to see materialise what we've been forecasting for years. I also felt sad. We know that we are living, what we are living through now is just the beginning of much worse conditions to come. If you don't find that convincing, uh, check out the 80-page uh, IPCC synthesis report, which is arguably the most reviewed document in human history. It's terrifying. <laughs> the, 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 the climate science is there, the projections are there, and we need a government that not only accepts the science but acts according to advice from scientists. Thank you. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Roberts be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. no. I think the no I hadn't I hadn't called it. I <laughs> Do you want to divide? Yes. The noes have it. Division required ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is that Senator Roberts' motion be agreed to. Those uh, against will move to the right of the chair. Uh, those in favour will move to the right of the chair. Those against will move to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the nose and Senator Babbitt for as teller for the eyes. The result of the division is eyes three, nose 31. Therefore, the question is resolved in the negative.